very warm welcome to All Saints. I'm very sorry for the technical issues we've had this week, but it's great you're able to join us. Welcome to our harvest service. Harvest is a wonderful time to remember God's goodness and his kindness. In Genesis 8, verse 22, we read, As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. It's a wonderful time to stop and to thank God for every good thing that he gives us. This is a tomato grown from our garden this year. We may have panicked at the start of lockdown uh, and decided we needed to plant a load of fruit and veg. Uh, we planted the seeds, uh, but we didn't inject them. We didn't paint the fruit red. Uh, all we did was water it every now and then. We didn't use the right soil. We didn't use fertilizer. And yet God made it grow. God is the one who gives us harvest to remember his great gifts to us. And so harvest is the time to say thank you. Let me pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to stop and to remember that you are the giver of good gifts. And we pray that today you would help us to say thank you. Amen. We're going to do that in the words of our first song uh, the church hours have kindly played for us. Harvest is also a time to remember that one day God will bring his final harvest in. He'll gather all of his people together. And so we're going to spend some time confessing our sin. We know that it is uh, something that is with us now, but one day we will be free from sorrow, free from sin when God gathers that harvest. And so let's take a moment to confess our sins together. Please join in with the words in bold. God our Father, we are sorry for the times when we have used your gifts carelessly and acted ungratefully. Hear our prayer, and in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We enjoy the fruits of the harvest, but sometimes forget that you have given them to us. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We belong to a people who are full and satisfied, but ignore the cry of the hungry. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We are thoughtless and do not care enough for the world you have made. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We store up good for ourselves alone, as if there were no God and no heaven. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. May Almighty God have mercy upon us and forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Julian and Annalie for our all-age slot.
Good morning. Now, we love harvest time. It's a chance to say a massive thank you to God for giving us such an amazingly fruitful world. And so today we thought we'd start with an old favourite and then have something brand new. So let's begin with our favourite bit of harvest theology, the story of the Bible in 12 fruits. Now, the whole of the Bible forms one amazing, um, overarching story. It's the story of how God reaches out to us. And all of the Bible, from Genesis, to the Psalms, to the Gospels, to Revelation, all points to Jesus. So, every story we have in the Bible whispers the name of Jesus. And we want to tell you the whole Bible story with these 12 fruits. So, we have a watermelon. We have a pear. We have an apple, we have a mango, we have lychees, we have a star fruit, we have a lime, and then over here, we have grapes, a plum, a passion fruit, a grapefruit, and a peach. So, the story of the Bible in 12 fruits. God has given us the gift of the world. He is its creator and he has said it is good. Now, the last of God's creations was the first pair of humans, Adam and Eve. He left humans in charge of his world to look after it. And God gave us the gift of choice. He didn't force us to love him, but wanted us to do so of our own free will. It was a risk, and in fact, we chose to go our own way. But it's not just Adam and Eve. It's a choice that we have all had to make through the ages. We have chosen our own way and not God's. And what was the result? Man goes from bad to worse, a bit like the puns. And all that is destructive and painful begin to spoil the world. To help us, God has given us guidance in the Ten Commandments to show us the best way to live the way to stop the lying and the cheating. The lie cheating that hurt each other. Now, God's big rescue plan was the star that hung over the manger when Jesus was born. God's gift to the world was his only son who came to show us the sort of people we should be and provide the way for us to start again. For three years, he preached and healed and his teaching was sublime but like grapes are crushed to form wine jesus allowed himself to be crushed by all the bad that was spoiling our world jesus went right down to the depths of all the pain and the suffering in the world taking it into himself plumbing its depths out of love for us and he experienced death and they buried him in a tomb and on the third day he rose again, he was alive. There was a new beginning made possible out of his passion. The fruit of his passion is the new life that he offers to us. Now, we too can bear great fruit as his love works in our lives. But it depends on one thing, whether we say yes to God. It's up to each of us to make our response. And it's not just a thank you at harvest time, but a thank you for God's grace all the time. So that we might become the best that we are meant to be, part of the first fruits of the new creation that Jesus has made possible for us all. And, and that's, that's why, why we're bananas, bananas for Jesus. Jesus. So, we're now going to have a new song. We're going to sing a new song to the Lord. So, a few weeks ago, uh, Via and Averitt and Lion and myself wrote a song which reflects some of our favourite part of God's amazing creation. It reflects a, a bit of Psalm 90 where it says that the before the mountains were formed or you brought forth the whole earth from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So there are actions and a brand new video with thanks to the churchyards, uh, their uh, production studios uh, for help with this. Uh, so from everlasting to everlasting, do sing along or dance. You are the one, you made the sun, you made the mountains and the trees, you made the birds, you made the bees, 
You made the jellyfish in the seas From everlasting to everlasting You are God From everlasting to everlasting You are God You made the sky You made my eye You made ice cream and pumpkin pie You made the monkeys You made my nose sneeze You made the flowers and butterflies From everlasting to everlasting You are God From everlasting to everlasting You are God You made the roar The number four You made the pencil so I can draw You made the moon The month of June Crunchy carrots and dinosaurs From everlasting to everlasting You are God From everlasting to everlasting You are God You made the pigs And tasty things You made gorillas and chimpanzees You made the quails And slimy snails The mighty whales And you made me From everlasting to everlasting you are God 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 This morning's reading is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruits in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff, that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Just a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to us now so that we hear what you want us to hear and we take home what you want us to take home. In Jesus' name, Amen. Harvest Thanksgiving Sunday is always a happy occasion, one in which we thank God for the blessing of harvest and his good provision for us. And although it's different this year, it's a particularly good time to remind ourselves that God loves us and wants the best for us. Children, at harvest we'd normally have a wonderful array of fruits and vegetables as well as these lovely flowers. That's not possible today, but perhaps you can imagine them. In your pack you have a Rubik's snake. Can you think of your favourite fruit or vegetable and twist your snake into that shape? An apple or a banana or a potato perhaps, any fruit or vegetable that you really like, you can get started now. And this is the season when many of our young people will have started at a new school, a new course, maybe leaving home for college or university. This year they'll be facing formerly unknown challenges, but in every year, because we love them, we'll have probably said something like this to them. We don't mind which path in life you take. We just want you to be happy. And because God is our loving Heavenly Father, he says the same to us, I love you and I just want the best for you. I can imagine already there are a few raised eyebrows which the masks can't hide. Surely you may be thinking, she's got that a bit wrong. I'm sure that God wants me to be holy. He wants me to be faithful. He wants me to be loving. It can't be that he just wants me to be happy. Well, let's see what he tells us in the reading we've been given this morning. Would you have Psalm 1 open in the service sheets or in your Bibles at home? In the first word, it's the first word that sets the scene. 
It's that wonderful word, blessed. In your Bible at home, it might appear as happy. In Psalm 1, we discover what God means when he says that he just wants us to be happy. Like a good father whose child is starting out on life, our Heavenly Father tells us that life brings us choices. We can choose which path to take. He's not a parent who manipulates his child to take the path of his choosing. The choice is ours. And of course, the choice that we take will bring us consequences. God is fair and clear in his advice. He tells us that in his eyes there are two options, and these are the two paths that life will offer. He tells us that only one of those paths will bring us ultimate happiness. In verse 1, God begins with a negative. Happy or blessed is the one who does not do three things. Firstly, you'll be blessed if you do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The word wicked probably brings to mind people who carry out the most horrendous crimes. In the Bible, though, wicked people are those who disregard God. Secondly, we'll be blessed if we do not stand in the way of sinners, that is, people who flout God's will. And thirdly, we'll not be happy if we sit in the seat of mockers. And when we look carefully at those words, we'll see a downward slope from walk to stand to sit. Imagine yourself starting out at a new college or university, or later in life, a new job, or in any social situation, meeting new people from all sorts of different walks in life. Of course you'll want to get to know them, you'll want to hear about their experiences and their philosophies of life. If you're a Christian, you'll want to introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some may be very interested to hear what you have to say about him. And they may be attracted to Jesus, but you'll find that some are not interested at all. And their counsel to you, their advice, might be to grab every opportunity that you, you can to make the best of your life, however much harm that may do to others. You have a chance to lie at your interview? Go for it, they might, they might say. Your marriage is becoming stale? Why not look for a more exciting partner? But if you want to be ultimately happy, God says, don't take ungodly advice. Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. See it for what it is and get off that path. If you don't get off that downward path, you may soon find yourself standing, lingering, hanging about with people that the Bible calls sinners, those who do what you know is not the way God wants you to live. Do you remember the reading from Philippians last Sunday morning, which started, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. If your friends are influencing you to join them in doing what God clearly says is not his will, and at this stage of your Christian life, you're finding you don't have the strength or maybe even the will to resist, then you will need to leave that group. If you don't open your eyes and see it for what's happening, you'll slip even further from the blessed path and find yourself, end of verse 1, sitting in the seat of mockers. Once you find yourself part of a circle of friends who mock your faith in Jesus, who ridicule your Christianity, you'll find it very hard to stay firm as a Christian. So our lo loving Heavenly Father warns us to be aware of the dangers of that miserable, slippery slope. What then can we do to be happy as a Christian, to grow in our, no, strong enough in our faith to resist outside pressures? God tells us in verse 2, the happy, the blessed person is one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. These are the people who will make time to read the Bible. They'll ask God, the Holy Spirit, to speak to them through its pages. They'll find that in difficult situations, they'll be able to recall parts of God's word, which will encourage and strengthen them. And they'll find that God speaks to them personally through the Bible. This is delightful. It can even become addictive. 
the one addiction that doesn't drag us down but builds us up. When we get our roots down into God's word, we find it produces in us good, wholesome food that nourishes, strengthens us and makes us fruitful. There's a promise for a person who delights in God's word. Look at the end of verse 3. Whatever he does prospers. We'll see that God's prosperity is not about flying through your exams without having done any revision, nor about having great wealth or influence, not about being a famous celebrity. It's a different kind of prosperity, which we'll come back to in a moment. But here's the snag. I'm not always like that blessed person, meditating on the Bible day and night. Then sometimes I can find myself in a social situation when someone says something that, as a Christian, I disagree with. I feel uncomfortable. I know I should speak up for Jesus. And I've come to realise that that uncomfortable feeling is the Holy Spirit tapping on my conscience. But I keep quiet because I don't want to spoil the mood of the gathering. Or is it really that I don't want to be laughed at or thought to be odd? So how about you? We hate to be mocked for our faith, don't we? And sometimes we do what we know displeases God. So in God's eyes, we are all sinners. But how gracious God is. Children, this is the time now for you to make the shape of a cross. Can you have a go now? Can you make a cross shape from your Rubik snake? Because Jesus died on the cross to offer us all forgiveness. All we have to do is ask. He was resurrected and ascended to give us his resurrection life. And he promised his disciples that when the Holy Spirit came, they would understand much more about Jesus. And of course, they found that that happened. After the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, he showed them that their beloved Old Testament scriptures all point to Jesus. Psalm 1 is no exception. As the early Christians read about the man who is blessed, they realised that he was one particular man, Jesus Christ. And throughout the years, many others have made the same discovery. The great reformer Martin Luther wrote, Psalm 1 speaks literally concerning Christ. He is the only blessed one, the only man from whose fullness we have been blessed. Just think, who do we know who never walked in the counsel of the wicked, who never stood in the way of sinners, who never sat in the seat of mockers? Who do we know whose delight has always been in the law of the, law of the Lord, who has meditated on it day and night? Jesus started meditating on the scriptures and delighting in them from a very early age. In Luke 2, at the age of 12, he was found in the temple, engaging with the religious experts, showing astonishing perception of the scriptures. Jesus Christ is the man of Psalm 1, verse 1. What does the psalm tell us that Jesus is like? Verse 3. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now where have we heard of a lovely tree like that in the Bible before? It's right at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, and that beautiful tree is called the Tree of Life. And then on the last page of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 22, we find that same Tree of Life planted by streams of water, Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. John writes, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. What a wonderful tree, 
a tree which brings healing and which produces a fruitful harvest, not only in the summer, but throughout every month of the year. Jesus is the Lord of life and the healer. His life brought him his father's blessing and prosperity. Not prosperity as the world knows it, when that is achieved, wealth, celebrity, political influence, fame, they often disappoint. They fail to bring true satisfaction. The quality of happiness that God wants us to have is a far, far deeper joy and fulfilment. It's a joy that we can experience now and throughout our lives into eternity. For Jesus, it was a prosperity of fruitfulness, a prosperity of a substantial, worthwhile life of purpose, of inner poise and stability, and of sustaining grace in times of appalling darkness, a prosperity that never ended, but continues in eternal life. And that's the joy, the blessedness, that he offers anyone who wishes to be grafted into him, the tree of life. Jesus has become God the Father's one source of spiritual life. We've all failed to live totally blessed lives, but Jesus has done so. He promises us forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit, streams of living water flowing from him, waves of blessing flowing on in us to eternal life. His invitation is open to absolutely everyone. All we have to do is to accept and receive him. When we receive Jesus Christ, when we are grafted into him, we can become branches of that tree and hold out life-giving fruit to others. We begin to find that the Bible is a blessing too. We are fed spiritually on God's word, we're strengthened in our faith, and we receive Christ's grace to speak to others about our faith. Instead of being dragged down by the atheism of the world, our life becomes worthwhile, a life of purpose, productivity and fulfilment, which continues into eternity. Children, here's a difficult shape to try. Can you twist your Rubik's snake into the shape of a tree? If not, try making the shape of a heart to represent God's love for us. A tree or a heart. Because of the coronavirus, we could be approaching a much darker, more dismal winter than usual. But there's no need to be afraid or depressed. Outwardly, our lives could be more difficult. But if we're grafted into the tree of life, we can enjoy inwardly a spiritual summer all through the dark months. Not only can we experience the joy of his fruitfulness, his love, his peace and his presence, but we can hold out the fruit of Christ to bring healing and life to others. But, verse 4, not so the wicked, not so those who reject Jesus Christ. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Visiting Norfolk at harvest time to visit family, Ian and I have often seen the farmers working day and night with their great combine harvesters to bring in the grain. Huge clouds of chaff rise up. All the tiny husks that are no use, they get caught up in the wind and are gone. The precious grain, which will become our food, is carefully stored in the, into the, in the grain stores. The chaff is good for nothing. God sees people who turn away from his offer of forgiveness in Jesus Christ as chaff. So often we think of those people as substantial, influential people, or maybe trendsetters, celebrities, and we may be tempted to wish that we could be like them. But come God's great harvest, they will not stand in the judgment if they have rejected Christ. In God's eyes, they are so lightweight that they will be blown away. There's no middle way. No third option. Jesus died for us all because we all need forgiveness and we all have a choice. 
those who receive Christ are made right with God. And as our psalm tells us, God, the Lord watches over them. But the way of the wicked will perish. So it's your choice. Do choose Jesus and his fruitfulness. Choose life. Let's pray. Lord of harvest, thank you for blessing us with our daily bread and so much more. Thank you especially for creating us with a spiritual appetite as well. And thank you for sending the Lord Jesus to bring us spiritual life and growth and fulfilment. Amen. Dear God, each season brings something new for us to see and enjoy. And in these unprecedented times, let us take time to look at the amazing world you've created and the joys to your creation. We give thanks for the sun and the rain to mature our crops. We give thanks to the farmers and workers who tend to and supply the food we eat daily. As we come together to give thanks for all we have and to let us remember people who may not have enough, we pray for all families all around the world who are suffering. We pray for peace where there is conflict. We pray for bounty harvests in which everyone can share. Let us pray for the local churches and the harvest, harvest collections to be pen, plentiful to help those in need. We pray for good mental health and understanding as we continue to live our lives in such different times. We pray for our families, our friends, our church. We pray for those who feel lonely and isolated, who feel your love and will be filled with your spirit, to know that they are not alone, to feel your love, to talk to you, to walk with you and to know of life ever after with you. The mission we are praying for this week is Don Nevere. We pray with them and for them. We pray for children who have contracted COVID. We pray for those in hospitals and for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for God's presence, peace and grace throughout the academic year, for teachers and staff, students and parents. We pray that the schools will stay open and that children's spiritual and mental health needs will be met. We pray for all those in need. We pray to our church family who are sick. We pray for Kate, Linda, Tony, Paul, Heather, Pauline and Joyce. Let them feel your arms around them as we pray. Please join us in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
A final prayer and blessing as we close. We give you thanks, most gracious God, for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, for the richness of mountains, plains and rivers, for the songs of birds and the loveliness of flowers. We praise you for these good gifts and pray that we may safeguard them for our posterity. Grant that we may continue to grow in our grateful enjoyment of your abundant creation to the honour and glory of your name, now and forever. Amen. May God the Father, who clothes the lilies and feeds the birds of the air, and who in his Son gives us all we need for life, bring about fruit in our lives in the power of the Spirit, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week at 11 o'clock. Thank you.